Can you guys hear me okay? All right, well, um, let's get started. First, um, thanks everybody for coming out. Um, I woke up this morning, I didn't know if I was gonna make it because it's pretty cold and nasty out there. So it's <laughs> like, yeah, we can reschedule for another day. Um, but I'm here and uh, let's talk about Wiley Jones. Now, I know a lot of people think they know who Wiley Jones was and what Wiley Jones did. And most people, you know, they know about the streetcar company and they know he was rich and that's about what they know. But there's so much more to who Wiley Jones is. And so that's what I want to talk about today. Now, I am going to use um, the terms black, African-American, colored, Negro. I'm going to use those terms interchangeably. So don't be alarmed if you hear me say um, colored or Negro. I know sometimes those words are kind of anachronistic and people get a little antsy about hearing them, but it's history and that's how we talk. So who, who is Wiley Jones? So becoming Wiley Jones. And so another thing that I will say is you'll hear me call him Wiley. And that's because I've been with him for over three years now. So I feel that we are friends and I can call him Wiley. All right. Got to turn it on. So our story begins in Morgan County, Georgia, about an hour southeast of Atlanta. A man named George Jones owns a small plantation with about 40 enslaved people. And one of these people is a woman named Ann. And now Ann has caught George's eye because the story goes that Ann was rather attractive. And George decided that he's going to have a sexual relationship with Ann, whether she wants to or not. And I say it like that because Ann was enslaved. And Ann lacked the freedom and the agency to make a choice in this situation. Now, I know there are going to be people who would disagree with me and say that, oh, but what about Sally Hemings and Thomas Jefferson? Well, same situation applies. Sally Hemings did not have the agency or the choice to decline Thomas Jefferson's advances, and so they had children. So I believe that no enslaved person has the choice, the agency, to consent to a consensual relationship with a slave owner, an overseer, or any white person at the time. So to this non-consensual relationship, between slave owner George and enslaved woman Ann, six children were born. And on July 14th, 1848, Ann gave birth to the fourth of these children, a boy that she named Walter. And she named him Walter because she named him after the doctor who delivered him. Now he would later earn the nickname Wiley because stories say he was such a uh, mischievous child that his mom started to call him Wiley and this is the name that he chose to use throughout the rest of his life. Now little is known about the first few years of Wiley Jones's life because he was a slave and little is known about most slaves but what we do know is that at the age of five years old in 1853 George Jones decided to leave Georgia and move to Arkansas. Now he packed up all of his belongings and possessions, including his human property of about 40 enslaved people that included his six children and their mother and a journey to Arkansas. And once they arrived in Arkansas, they ended up in Jefferson County on a plantation uh, about 12 miles north of Pine Bluff that was owned by uh, Senator George, I'm sorry, Senator Richard Byrd. Now, shortly, arrive, shortly after arriving in Arkansas, George Jones died. And now this is where the story begins to take a turn. Uh, one of the biographies that was written during Wiley's life claims that his mother was told by George Jones that upon her death, she and the kids would be freed. Um, and Anne 
The biography also referred to Anne as George's wife, but I've explained to you why I don't put a lot of credence into this claim. And so Anne thought that when George died, that she and her children would be freed. However, no papers were found, and Anne and their children were sold along with George's other possessions. Anne, who had lived with this man and believed that she was his wife, and their six children were sold with the horses and the mules and the plows and everything that George owned. Anne died believing that George had agreed to free her and her children. And so shortly after, after George's death, Anne disappears from the historical record. So the children, um, including Wiley, were sold to a man named Peter Finnerty, who was a New York transplant. Uh, he was born around 1815. He spent a little time in Illinois, and he arrived in Jefferson County sometime before 1854. And then, a short time later, prior to Wiley's 10th birthday in 1858, they were sold to a man named James Yale. Now, the name Yale probably sounds familiar to Arkansans, and it should, because Archibald Yale was the second governor of the state of Arkansas and served from 1840 to 1844. Now, in 1838, he convinced his nephew James to move to Arkansas. Uh, James did and soon became politically active in the state. He served as a state senator from 1842 to 1845, and he ran for governor on the American Party ticket in 1856 and was soundly defeated. Now, some of you may have heard of the American Party, uh, if not by their name, the American Party, then by the name of the Know-Nothing no Party. Uh, they were a far-right, anti-Catholic, anti-immigration, and xenophobic party. James Yale was also an early proponent of Arkansas secession, and he served as a delegate to the 1860 secession convention. And after the state seceded, he was appointed as a major general in the Arkansas Army, despite any military experience. He failed and was relieved of his duty. Uh, he felt that, the, that he was treated poorly and he left the state. He ended up in Waco, Texas, where he returned to practicing law and uh, opposed the Confederate government, even going as far as to defending Union sympathizers. Now, shortly after James Yale acquired uh, the Jones children, he gave 10-year-old Wiley to his son, Fountain, as a wedding gift. Now, Fountain Gale was also politically active. He served in the Arkansas General Assembly, and in 1861, he um, resigned his uh, seat in the Assembly and enlisted in the Confederate Army and quickly rose through the ranks. He achieved the rank of full colonel. And so he went away to war, and 13-year-old Wiley accompanied him as a camp servant. Um, he, Wiley Jones was present at the Battle of Prairie Grove along the White River, the Battle of Devil's Backbone near Greenwood, and the Battle of Pleasant Hill in Louisiana, where Fountain Yale was killed in battle. After Fountain was killed, 16-year-old Wiley Jones had to make his way from Louisiana to Waco. So imagine a 16-year-old boy who has been taken away from his family, witnessed the horrors of war, now the only person that you know there is dead, and you have to try and figure out how to get from Louisiana to Waco, Texas, where the rest of your family is. Well, he made it. And um, he reunited with his family. And while he was in Waco, he drove a cotton wagon from Waco to San Antonio. And uh, after the war, both the Yales and the Joneses returned to Arkansas, spending some time in Monticello, and then returning to Pine Bluff in 1865. Now, the war is over, freedom has come, and 17-year-old Wiley Jones is faced with the decision that would alter the remainder of his life. Where is he going to live? 
So he narrowed his choice down to two cities, Pine Bluff and Fort Smith. Now, Pine Bluff was an option because he had grown up in Pine Bluff and his siblings lived in Pine Bluff. And Fort Smith was an option because he had spent time in Fort Smith when he was with Fountain Yale, who was in Company A of the Arkansas 26th Regiment, which had spent some, some time in Fort Smith. And Fort Smith was an up and coming city. There were missionary schools for black people there. So that was an option. Wally Jones, as we know, he ultimately chose Pine Bluff. Um, and in 1870, the census reports that he was living with his sister Julia and her husband Ben, along with their two-year-old son. Um, he was living with his sister and his brother-in-law, and so this created an opportunity for Wally Jones um, to save some money. So uh, he worked as a porter in a hotel. He also, also living there with his sister were four of his younger brothers, Taylor, Andrew, I'm sorry, three of his younger brothers, Taylor, Andrew, and John. Um, during this time, 22-year-old Wiley Jones worked as a mule driver, earning $20 a month. He was also the manager of the Yale Plantation, which was I mentioned north of Pine Bluff, and a porter in a saloon. After a year of this, he was able to rent a barber's chair at his brother-in-law's barber shop, and he cut hair for 10 years. During this period, he used his earnings from the jobs that he was working to loan money to other black people in the city, charging uh, interest, and so he made money off of that. He also began to buy real estate at this time, and during the period between 1870 and 1880, Wiley Jones amassed a small fortune. He was able to leave the Reed house and buy his own house, eventually building a home at 1906 Georgia Street, and in 1880, he's listed, in the 1880 census, he's listed as the head of household, and his brother Andrew was living with him. Now, it was during this time that he was able to open a whiskey business, uh, a saloon, and he, this would earn him even more money and influence. Um, what you see on the screen here is an artist's rendering of some of the things that Wiley Jones was involved in. So he was a horseman, which we'll get to. He built a park called the Wiley Jones Park. Uh, here is the saloon that he owned, and this is uh, scenes from the Wiley Jones Park where the street cars would come. And I'll give you more detail about all of those as we go. So one newspaper reported during the, during the time um, when he had this saloon that was very profitable, very influential, um, that there was a period of unrest in Pine Bluff, and Wiley's saloon was the only one that was allowed to remain open uh, because he had political connections. So, Wiley Jones um, gained international acclaim through his efforts in harness racing. The black community in Pine Bluff was really big into harness racing, uh, so much so that each Thanksgiving day, local businesses would close at noon and they would hold races at Wiley Jones Park. Uh, Jones invested a great deal of his wealth into his love of harness racing. He owned several racing horses. Um, some of them were named Executor, which I put Excalibur, that should say Executor. Uh, Trickster, Soil Danny, and Billy H. Now, Billy H. broke the uh, record at a track in Windsor, Canada, which is how he started to get some of this international acclaim. And the most famous of his horses was Executor. Uh, Jones, he, brought Executor, he bought Executor in 1880, um, and they even went as far as to build an advertising campaign around Wally Jones and Executor. Um, it was a campaign for a horse bomb and it was run for a couple of months in the Pine Bluff Daily Graphic in Pine Bluff. And the ad basically said that um, Wiley Jones, famed horseman, said, without this bomb, I would have lost my fastest horse. And so this was run, and um, this bomb was sold to farmers throughout the area, and Wiley Jones was their pitch man. Um, so he owned Executor for 22 years. And in um, 1902, the horse died. 
and the Arkansas Democrat reported on the horse's death. Um, they noted that at one point in the ex in executor's life, Wiley Jones was offered $7,000 for the horse, but he turned it down. In addition to this horse and other horses, he owned a herd of cattle that he kept at his farm, which was called Pine Grove Stock Farm that was located southeast of Pine Bluff. Sometime between 1890 and 1992, Wiley Jones built the Wiley Jones Park at 1900 Georgia Street in Pine Bluff. So what I, what I wanna show you guys here is, this is a, uh, a map from the U.S. Index, uh, the U.S. Um, Index County Land Ownership map, and so it shows here. I've highlighted in yellow. This is all land that Wiley Jones owned. Right here is Wiley Jones Park. This is Wiley Jones Edition. Oh, that blew that up. <laughs> and this is Wiley Jones's estate. Now I've um, highlighted a couple of streets in red. 17th Avenue and Tennessee Avenue to kind of give you, if you're familiar with Pine Bluff, you can kind of imagine where this was. So the park was 55 acres and it had a half mile track, stables for the horses, a baseball diamond, an amusement park, and the colored people's fairgrounds were all um, housed on in Wiley Jones Park. So, um, Wiley Jones Park was a focal point of the black community in Pine Bluff. Um, on the 4th of July in 1892, St. John's AME Church hosted a citywide barbecue at the park. In addition to the barbecue, the park also hosted horse racing, bicycle racing, school events, chicken pie fighting, and pigeon shooting. The park was also home to the Pine Bluff Owls, a baseball team owned by Wiley Jones. Um, Wiley Jones Park also became home to the Colored State Fair. Now this was a fair that was organized, organized by, um, by the Colored State Fair Association in 1886. This was a group of black men um, from Little Rock, Pine Bluff, Dermont, and Holly Grove, which included Wiley Jones. Their purpose was to develop the agricultural, mechanical, and commercial industry of the colored people of Arkansas. So what they did was they would host this fair each year, and uh, kind of like the state fair today, they would say, hey, bring your animals, bring anything that you have, and they would have competitions, and people would come out and see. This image is the grandstand at the Wiley Jones uh, Park um, with near the racetrack. I don't know if you can see there's a horse here and so people would come in and watch the harness racing. Um, so Wally Jones is probably most known as the first black man in the country to own and operate a streetcar line. He applied for and was awarded a contract to construct a streetcar line in 1886. The line would extend from downtown Pine Bluff to Wiley Jones Park. So he built this um, streetcar line so people could get to his park, um, you know. Um, because the park was just outside the city limits and so he wanted people to e well, easily get back and forth to the park. The Arkansas Democrat noted that three beautiful coaches were running on the Wiley Jones Street Railway. Now, this is 1886. Two years later, Wiley Jones was sued by a competing streetcar line the Citizens Railway Company, and they argued that Wiley Jones's car line infringed on their exclusive right to build on, and I quote, the right of way on, over, and along, Barracue, Broadway, Fieldgate, Newton, and all other streets within the present, future corporate limits of the city. So it doesn't give much room for anybody else to operate a streetcar. Um, so they went to court, and H.C. Uh, Caldwell ruled in Jones's favor writing in part that the streets that Jones, the Jones line occupied were not a part of citizens' plans. Citizens appealed to the Supreme Court of the United States. However, while the case was making its way to the Supreme Court, the parties settled, a deal was struck, and Jones agreed to buy citizens for $125,000. Um, 
he would become the president, and later he sold it, at a, sold the combined company at a loss. Now, one of the things that many people have heard is that um, Wiley Jones Streetcar Company is still in operation. The city of Palm Bluff bought it. It became uh, Southeast Arkansas Transit. I've even said that because that's what somebody told me. But while working on the research, I found out that he sold the line because it was losing money because, as you can see, these are mule-drawn carriages. Well, people were clamoring for electric streetcars, and that became all the rage in the city, so he sold it at a loss. Now, Wiley Jones was involved in a lot of different business ventures. Um, this is an ad for um, his whiskeys, wine, and cigars. So this was a company that he had at 223 Main Street, and his brother James was, the, uh, was running that for him. He also joined with Marion Perry and Ferdinand Havis, who was his sometime friend, his sometime adversary. And together, these three men opened the Southern Mercantile Company. This is an image of the inside of the Southern Mercantile Company. It was a general store, and it was on Main Street in downtown Palm Bluff. They catered to sharecroppers in the area. Um, he also owned a saloon and was a wholesale liquor distributor. In 1889, he and a man named Edward Houston attempted to revive a resort area called White Sulphur Springs. This area was about two miles southeast of Pine Bluff and contained um, natural sulphur springs. And so people would go there and kind of hang out like hot springs. It was once a spa and resort town, but burned in the mid 1880s and they planned to revive it. They had a plan for a 23 block town with a main street called Cleveland Avenue, which is now Highway 54, if you guys are familiar with the area. Um, and they filed for a post office and built a hotel in 1892, but in 1893, the hotel burned and it was rebuilt in 1894, but uh, Wiley Jones had pulled out of the adventure at that point. Now, Wiley Jones was also active in the, active member of the black community in Palm Bluff. He was a patron to the Colored Industrial Institute. Uh, that was a school that was started and run by the Sisters of Charity of Nazareth, of Nazareth, a group of Catholic nuns with the purpose of training colored youth in the youthful industrial arts and imparting good literary education. It opened in 1879 and was the first of its kind in the state. It was near Wiley Jones Park. Also near Wiley Jones Park was St. Peter's Catholic Church and he was a contributor there it was the first Catholic church in the state for black people, and he donated an altar to the church that was valued at $300 in 1894, which would be about $9,000 today. He was also a member of the Grand United Order of the Odd Fellows. He was a member of the Knights of Pythias. He was a patron of the Colored Industrial Institute, which I mentioned. He donated the altar. He was a member of the Colored State Fair and he was active in Jefferson County politics. Um, so this is the Colored Industrial Institute. Here's an image of it and one of the graduating classes. It's interesting because this is the 1890s and there are women who are graduating from the Colored Industrial Institute. Uh, they added a house later off to the side so that they could allow women to attend as well. So this image is James Jones, uh, one of Wiley's brothers. Um, so I mentioned that Wiley Jones was involved, actively involved in Republican Party politics. He never ran for office, but he did support his brother who ran for sheriff in 1884 against John Clayton, the younger brother of Powell Clayton, who we all know was a powerful political boss here in the state. Um, James lost to Wiley Jones, I'm sorry, to, um, John Clayton, and this began to sour uh, Wiley's relationship with Ferd Havis and the uh, Pulaski County, I'm sorry, Jefferson County uh, Republican Party. So Wiley Jones died on December 7th, 1904. He died um, from a heart disease uh, as a result of Bright's disease. Um, his doctor said that he took a nap after breakfast and never woke up. 
He was never married and he had no children. He was survived by three brothers and a sister. His funeral was held at the Masonic Temple on 12th and Main, which he donated the land when they built the building. He was respected by both black and white alike. Newspapers from all over the country reported on his death and Adolphus Bush of the famed Bush family wrote this um, open letter to the Pine Bluff Daily Gra or the Arkansas Democrat. And it says, I don't know if you guys can see it, but it says, I learned with deep regret of the death of our good friend, Wally Jones. He was one of the foremost men of the colored race and won the respect and admiration of all who knew him. Please express our sympathy to the bereaved family, Adolphus Bush. Pretty big deal. Um, but this is not the end of the story, his death. He left a massive estate uh, that had an estimated value anywhere between, I've heard, 100000 all the way to $300,000. And after his death, lawsuits that were filed that related to his various business ventures, including uh, one that bankrupted the Southern Mercantile Company. And so that's what you see here. This is the headline from a newspaper that says, Wally Jones' estate sued for $14,575, when in actuality, they were suing the Southern Mercantile Company but it was considered, it was synonymous with Wiley Jones. Um, and there was one uh, lawsuit where James Jones uh, was uh, appointed the executor of the wheel, uh, but because it's the, eight, the early 1900s, there was a, a white man in town who wanted to get Wiley Jones's land, and so he offered James Jones five, six thousand dollars, and he transferred the executorship to him, but then the estate was sued because there was another man who said that Wiley owed him money, and so he didn't want this new guy being able to get the money. Um, in 1913, a dubious claim was made. Three people from Ohio claimed to be heirs and wanted a part of the estate. This case was dismissed due to lack of evidence. So you get uh, three people out of Ohio saying that they were descendants of the Jones family and they were heirs and they wanted their part of the, uh, the estate. But nowhere in the research do we see Wiley Jones ever spending any time in Ohio, nor do we see any of his brothers spending time or sisters spending time in Ohio. There are those that say you know, Wiley Jones owned land in Waco, Texas, and Muskogee, Oklahoma. Um, but as with a lot of African American history, um, people make things up. People inflate claims, they make things up. They take one thing that they hear and they just spread it and go crazy with it. But uh, this claim was um, di dismissed. So this is Wiley Jones's uh, grave marker. He's buried in Pine Bluff on land that he owned, which became a cemetery. And um, finally, his life was marked by achievement uh, and the fact that he was a, a man of many firsts. He was the first to own a streetcar company, uh, the first black man to own a, uh, to build a, a racing track. But his life does more than that. Um, it counters the white supremacy narrative. He and, he, and his successes proved that African Americans could and did accomplish great things. Jones was able to build an empire only 15 years removed from the, one of the greatest stains on this country, slavery. His story and stories like his are important in the fight against racism. Yes, Jones faced racism in his life, but he did not let it deter him in his struggle for greatness. In my opinion, he should be remembered with his contemporaries like J.P. Morgan and John Rockefeller and other business tycoons of this age. Thank you.